London, the great capital. More people than in any other city in the world, forever on the move over its vast surface. Eleven million journeys made every day by London transport vehicles. Chelsea gets to Chigworth, Windsor to Wapping, High Beach to High Barney. The far reaches of the city stretch out to each other and all London is linked together. By its easily recognized visual characteristics, London Transport signposts the traveller and speeds him through this giant sprawl. The circle and crossbar on every bus stop and station. The bullseye symbol is there to reassure. The very way the word is written is like the familiar voice of a friend. The look of London Transport is its personality. No need to ask a policeman. This famous poster appeared a few years before World War I. The map to which the London Bobby calls the country couple's attention shows the transport enterprises of nearly half a century beginning to come together. The various railway companies are familiar to us still as lines on the underground. Several railways operated short tube services. The Metropolitan and District Railway linked them at key points just under the surface. Station architecture naturally followed the fashion of the time. Some of it is indestructible still. Lettering was in a variety of styles. Posters echoed poignantly, it seems now, the confident mood of the moment. Then, in 1914, yesterday's toy, the flying machine, became tomorrow's weapon. The underground station took on another meaning. In it, London citizens sheltered from the Zeppelin bomb. 1918 and the armistice, where once the shelter had slept in the underground, is a new generation seeking the newfound pleasures of ragtime and jazz, and returning Tommy, eager to resume the life they left behind. When Britain emerged into the sunshine of an age which promised peace, a feeling of progress was in the air, a desire to clear up the mess of the past and build a brave new world. Under the chairmanship of Lord Ashfield, unification of London's transport system was already well on the way financially. It remained for someone to give it a unified look. In 1916, a man named Frank Pick, on behalf of the new Underground Railway Group, had commissioned a new sans serif typeface from one of Britain's leading typographers, Edward Johnston. The result is the clear, bold Johnston lettering that graces London's transport system, a truly 20th century achievement. Next, Frank Pick turned to the art of the poster, and to get an unconventional approach to familiar subjects, he encouraged young artists like Clive Gardner with his cubist touch, Rex Whistler with his flair for neoclassical fantasy, and particularly E. McKnight Cowper, whose bold, colourful stylization broke new ground in poster technique. By the 1920s, he had included architecture in the scheme. In the new tube stations on the Northern Line extension, a new architect, Charles Holden, introduced new forms. At Morden, the station became more than just a point of arrival and departure. With bus routes converging from the surrounding area, with a parade of shops, a post office, and a bank, the station was a pleasant and convenient focal point for the entire district, almost a miniature civic center. 55 Broadway was built, shaped like a cross to give maximum daylight, a new transport headquarters with new entrances to the existing St. James's Park station, over which it is superbly strutted. Controversy raged over its decoration. Sculpture by artists then considered revolutionary. Epstein's groups have perhaps stood the test of time better than the others. Certainly, they're considered among his finest works. In the essential accessories of transport, bus shelters and street furniture, the design policy sought to make beauty of line and functional advantage one and the same thing. In the country, rural materials were used notices unobtrusively placed. Bus stop signs, a stable general style, 
allowing minor changes of detail. The framed notices giving way to the self-cleaning pattern, where the rain can wash its gently curved surface, looking its most elegant on the latest air-streamed concrete post. Even the litter bin, replacing many an unsightly wire basket, achieves a decorative effect. So too does the platform mailbox. And the seat covering, designed by leading textile artists. Lamp standards like these have often been an object lesson in simplicity. But not everyone has grasped what London Transport has always believed. However handsome its buildings, a city's good looks need good-looking accessories. The atmosphere of urbane charm in modern London is echoed by bus and station signs, so that to the heritage of the past has been added good-mannered vitality and efficiency. And to the architecture of the jet age, London transport brings a welcome touch of the everyday world. Vehicle design is concerned with engineering as well as aesthetics. But the pursuit of fitness for purpose has produced pleasing results in this field, too. Clean, simple lines and details, careful attention to practical working, textures that are pleasing to the hand, stanchions conveniently placed for getting on and off. In the underground, as in the buses, attention is paid to surfaces as well as to functional details. Safety devices, such as the sliding doors, are integrated so as to be part of the design. During normal running, the passenger is offered comfort as well as speed. During rush hour periods, the underground is designed to carry the greatest possible number with all possible speed in filling and emptying. of the mid-twenties had started an architectural tradition and the result was a new look amongst the buildings of London. Wherever suitable, the civic centre idea which had proved so successful at Morden was further developed, producing at Southgate, for instance, a unit of station, bus terminus and shopping centre which well reflects the character of the district. The motives of electric power are suggested in the decorative station finial. London transport is unique in that it embraces under one system the underground, town and country buses and fast long distance coaches. Out on the roads beyond the outlying underground station, the Green Line coach and the country bus take good and appropriate design into the country and the country town. It is perhaps in communal amenities that the greatest contribution has been made to London's life. Many European cities have a social life of the open space, the piazza, the plaza, or the Grand Place, which England's climate discourages. But in the underground station of central London, the need is fulfilled under cover, and yet in a completely public sense. and cafe entrances, telephone and tobacco kiosks, 
bookstores, and newsstands. A place to meet or wait. Sheltered, yet right in the heart of London. In first in design, a policy both imaginative and purposive still continues. More ephemeral than most art forms, the poster can afford to be up to the minute, stylish, sometimes even flippant. In a series of posters illustrating the diverse opportunities that the capital and its countryside offer to people seeking rewarding use of their leisure, modern artists have made the underground station a constantly changing picture gallery and have always kept in mind the need to sell a public service as well as to describe it. London Transport's recently been responsible for a number of new buildings of modern design. Here is Aldenham, the great new bus overhaul works near Watford. After something over three years' service on the road, every London bus comes here to be completely overhauled. Its offices and canteens show contemporary solutions for contemporary problems. Here is a new bus garage at Stockwell. The reinforced concrete roof soars up as imaginatively as the great glass and iron structures of the railway age. Like the Victorian architect engineers, the designers have used a new material with new ideas for a new purpose. In aiming at maximum efficiency in the provision of a great public service, London Transport also tries to live up to its own tradition of aesthetic and civic achievement. 